This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, it's only been days since we last saw each other, and yet so many exciting things to share with you. So glad you could join us for another edition of the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. He's right. We do have a lot of things to get to, starting with Governor Brian Kemp, who met with farmers affected by Hurricane Michael. We'll tell you about his conversation with President Trump and what exactly he told the Commander-in-Chief about the situation right here in Georgia. Speaking of politics, it's off to our nation's capital, where Georgia's young farmers pled their case to lawmakers We'll also take an in-depth look at ag issues currently being talked about on Capitol Hill. And then later, imagine watching helplessly as your family land is not only subjected to eminent domain, but ultimately destroyed in the process. Happened to this couple, and now they're sharing their story in hopes of preventing it from happening to others. All this and more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. Typically, one of the top peach producing states in the country, Georgia has taken a step back in recent years because of the losses it sustained due to poor weather. Damon Jones takes a look at this year's crop and tells you how it was affected by a recent cold snap. The last couple of years have been anything but peachy for growers of one of the state's signature crops as late freezes wiped out a majority of the peach harvest. That means getting a big yield this year is more important than ever. Uh, 2017 is probably the worst crop we've had in maybe 30 years. I mean, that's just um, once in a every few decade kind of crops. It was 20% of a crop, so it was a really tough year and had about a, maybe a 50% crop last year. So it's been two tough years in a row. So, so we were really hoping for a good crop of peaches this year. And one of the main factors in producing a good crop is getting enough chill hours. Thankfully, that hasn't been a problem this growing season. Um, we had a lot of wet weather, a lot of fog, and those, a lot of the people, a lot of the people that are smarter than me say that when we get chill hours in between 32 and 45, and, and, and on top of that have wet weather, foggy weather, a lot of moisture, that you actually get better chill hours. And if you look at just the hours, we were marginal, 800 and some hours, but when you look at the crop, what the flowers are doing, how the trees are coming out, leaves are coming out, um, all at the same time, you know, we, we got some really good chill. However, a recent cold front was a major cause for concern as the trees had already started to bloom. I was very worried uh, just seeing the conditions uh, yesterday morning just with the frost. Um, I've seen conditions uh, less than that do a lot of damage and especially you can see behind me, I mean this is one of our later varieties. Um, the risk was out there to really have a significant crop loss and it just didn't happen. Um, certainly there was some damage. It had all the right conditions, had low temperatures and frost on the ground last night, but the damage is mainly contained to some early varieties. I mean, it looks great, you know, considering the, the weather we came through this week, you know, we're all pretty excited because, you know, last year we had two nights in March that were pretty, pretty brutally cold and, and destroyed a lot of the early crop. And looking at looking at what we got left, I think we have we have an early crop, um, and our and our late crop looks just as good as it did last year or better. That's a major sigh of relief for growers and consumers, as the damage isn't even approaching the likes of 2017 or 2018. However, Cook is quick to point out to farmers they shouldn't let their guard down. I mean, you, when you look at a 50 percent crop or a or 50 percent crop loss or 60 or 70 percent crop loss, you know, we're not we're not anywhere close to that. Um, I do keep saying, you know, reminding everybody to keep praying because it is early in March and you know, we've, got, we've got about a month to go before we really feel like we're safe and out of the woods. With that recent scare out of the way, it's business as usual for growers for the next couple of months as they prepare for harvest. Um, really going to be spending a lot of time now just uh, making sure trees are healthy, getting the fertilizer they need, um, and, uh, you know, really trying to, you know, keep trees, you know, healthy and really ready to set a good crop of peaches. Reporting from Usella, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Now to some headlines. Governor Brian Kemp telling a group of farmers recently, quote, financial help is coming for those of you affected by Hurricane Michael. This is during a special meeting in Tifton hosted by the Georgia Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. Joining the governor, Ag Commissioner Gary Black, as well as a number of delegates via satellite from Washington, D.C., including Senators David Perdue and Johnny Isaacson. 
Uh, to show just how serious he is about getting farmers the help they need, Governor Kemp opened up about a recent phone conversation he had with President Trump. As you all know, he's had some frustrations with the, the aid package to Puerto Rico, and I, I certainly understand that, but I told him, you know, you and the Vice President and Secretary Purdue have all come down and offered their full support and help, and I said, these folks are counting on you, and we are too. We have helped our neighbors when they needed help. And I called Governor Ivey in Alabama after the devastating storm that hit Lee County and offered our full help and support if she needed it. And that offer still stands. But we need our help, too. And I know you all that know that more than most. Meantime, one of the best days on the Georgia legislative calendar, peanut butter and jelly day, a time when lawmakers, their staff, and anyone else who might be visiting get to sample some of the many wonderful peanut products Georgia has to offer. Additionally, festivities include the chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee and the chairman of the House Ag Committee, recognizing the state's peanut farmers for all their contributions and hard work. In the, in the nation, we grow over 50 percent of the peanuts. So into Georgia, it's a several million dollar industry to Georgia, several million dollar industry to Georgia. So it's big and uh, we are one of the top uh, commodities in the state also. So. It's big so far as contribution to the jobs in Georgia and uh, the revenues of the state of Georgia. In the meantime, members of the Georgia Farm Bureau Young Farmer and Rancher Program recently took their annual trip to D.C. and never fails. For it is, they had a blast, plus they accomplished what they set out to do. Yeah, Ray, the trip gives the members an inside look at the legislative process as well as a chance to voice concerns with their representatives, which could not have come at a better time, as John Holcomb explains. The Georgia Farm Bureau's Young Farmer and Rancher program is designed to develop the next generation of ag leaders in the state, which is why every year they travel to the nation's capital to meet with lawmakers to discuss issues that are important to them and put a face to the Georgia ag industry. The face-to-face -face meeting is, is just as important as a million emails. When you have a face-to-face -face visit, they put a face to the product, they put a face to the farm, to the dirt. So it's important for them to see and see the effects it has on uh, the livelihood of a, a person that's farming. The trip couldn't have come at a better time as there are a number of issues that lawmakers are trying to resolve on Capitol Hill that affect the Georgia ag industry. But the most important right now is disaster funding. We've got a number of other issues on our issue sheets, but uh, all of the energy and the focus right now on the Hill uh, with our delegation is on disaster funding. Uh, they're they're going to have to get that done before they can uh, shift focus to anything else. It's, it's kind of clogging up the legislative wheels right now, uh, so I think that's probably the biggest. During the office visits with lawmakers, you can bet that disaster funding was the main topic. And you can also bet that it was led by Preston Jimerson, a farmer in southwest Georgia that suffered devastating losses during Hurricane Michael. He, like most farmers in that area, need help and need it as fast as possible. Since the hurricane, um, everyone in South Georgia has suffered huge losses, uh, both emotionally and physically and financially. Uh, but we're at a point now where the hurricane relief was promised months and months ago. Since then, we've all made promises to bankers, to employees, and to ourselves that we would be able to overcome it and that the financial services and aid was coming. Uh, we're now at a point where if financial aid does not come very soon, you will see widespread bankruptcies and failures in the farm level in our state. After the meetings with the congressman, Preston, along with the rest of the group, feels confident that lawmakers are working their hardest to bring help back to Georgia. It was very reassuring to know that this isn't something they have forgot about. That's the way we feel in Southwest Georgia is that maybe we have been forgot about, but you come here and get reassured that that in fact is not the case. They, they are still fighting just as hard as they always have. And we finally got to a point where it seems we may be gaining traction. And that confidence isn't misguided, as Congressman Austin Scott says that disaster funding isn't looking like it's too far away at this point. I'm disappointed that it's taken this long. I'm, I'm happy at the same time that the number is a reasonable number. Uh, for for covering the losses and I'm hopeful that uh, certainly before uh, the Easter uh, the two-week Easter recess that we would have a bill signed and um, 
and hopefully within a couple of weeks of then, uh, four to six weeks at the outside, outside uh, have money actually making its way to the producers. Reporting in Washington for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. John, thank you so much. After the break, he started his own cattle operation when he was 11 years old. Now this very college student is being recognized for all his hard work. Like us, when you hear his story, we think you'll be equally impressed. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Chris Tyson. I'm the area onion agent and coordinator of the Vidalia Onion and Vegetable Research Center in Lyons, Georgia. Um, I started that uh, job on December 1st. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, working with the growers in the industry uh, with Vidalia Onions and um, uh, excited about the new job. Uh, the last six years I worked as a county agent in Tattnall County. So I worked with a lot of the onion growers in Tattnall County. Um, you know, I got to do a lot of the same things I will do in my new role. Um, I spent time in the field with them, visiting them, troubleshooting problems with them, and um, just helping them with their crop. Uh, I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up uh, close by in, in Bullock County. Um, I had some family that farmed, and that probably piqued my interest in, the, in it. And so um, I went to college uh, at ABAC and uh, pursued an ag degree there. And uh, just one thing led to another, and I've, I've been involved with agriculture ever since. Uh, my favorite part is uh, getting to get out and visit growers and, and be in the field. And, um, you know, that's the best part is, you know, I'm not sitting behind a desk all the time. Uh, I'm humbled to be able to work with this crop. Um, you know, I worked with uh, the Vidalia Onions for the last six or seven years. Um, uh, when I was working in Tattnall County as the extension agent and um, I'm just I'm just thankful and glad that I got the opportunity to move into this new role. Well those freezing temperatures we had recently didn't phase Adams Farms in Fayetteville. Check out the shots we captured with the farm monitor drone. Yes you see the strawberries protected by layers and layers of ice a system that owner Virginia Adams says has proven effective since the day they opened. You know, we've done that since 1998 when we first started growing strawberries. The, everybody did it that way at that time, and uh, we've not deviated from that plan. It's worked well for us. We don't lose any berries. A lot of work staying up at night monitoring the system, but it's worked and we haven't changed. If you continuously put water on the plants, whatever they be, if they be blueberries or strawberries, water gives off a few calories of heat as it freezes and it encapsulates every berry, every leaf, and protects them. It's just like a guard, like a blanket around each little leaf, each little strawberry. One thing too, I do blueberries, and you can't put roll covers on blueberries. It doesn't work. Uh, I've never figured out how to do it, but and we just gonna, it works, and if it works, it's not broke, so don't fix it. Well, Berry College senior Ben Umberger is now $11,000 richer after taking first place in the school's innovation and entrepreneurship pitch competition. But according to Ben, that money is already spent. You see, in addition to pursuing his degree in management, Ben is a successful cattleman and has been since the tender young age of 11 years old. I grew up on a small hobby farm and we had a couple horses and that sort of thing. Uh, my dad grew up on a big farm and I had always wanted to raise beef cows. I was always drawn to like the cowboy movies, uh, but I couldn't convince my dad to buy any cows. And so he was like, well, if you save up your money and you buy a calf, you know, you can do that. Um, and you know, that's okay with me. And so I started working for my neighbor who had uh, commercial chicken houses. He had layer hens. And so after school, I would go and pick eggs for him until I saved up my money and then retired from that and uh, bought my first calf. And really what I started doing 
was buying orphan calves like whose mothers had died and stuff like that and bottle fed them because I didn't have a lot of pasture to raise full grown cows but you know we had a little barn and a few acres and so for me that was something that I could manage easier on my own at that 11 years old. Well, so I know initially when I signed up and started, made it past the first round and moved in the second, I really felt kind of out of place because everybody else was, you know, doing, I guess, more normal businesses. Like some girls were making soaps and one had a bakery and t-shirts. And then I was there raising beef cows. And so I really felt kind of out of place and sort of awkward because, you know, it's, it's nobody else was doing anything with agriculture. Um, and so, yeah, at first it was kind of, Felt out of place, but then just realized that no, like this is something that's still really cool and it is different, but people do want to hear about it. It's really been encouraging and really just awesome to be part of that because recently, you know, I, I've borrowed money to sort of expand my farm and expand my business, but you know, just like you and most other farm people know, is farming has a lot of expensive inputs, and so you really have to increase your production and so for me this has really allowed me to sort of get that that jump almost like to the next level that otherwise would take me a few years to sort of manage and, and slowly build up to. I know a lot of times school has a tendency to, to get pushed back the last thing on the totem pole just because that can be done at night um, and you know so a lot of staying up late to, to do my schoolwork and stuff but then during the day trying to you know keep up with all this stuff on the farm looking after it um, but yeah, just a lot of really long hours and a lot of having to say no to a lot of other things um, that you know, most people, I guess, otherwise wouldn't have to say no to. Great future for that young man, that is for sure. Now, when we come back, advocating for eminent domain reform in the state of Texas, the emotional plea from this farm couple who says they were taken advantage of and the warning they have for others. We had done a lot of research on the wild horse issue because the wild horse issue in the country is a big issue. I think the numbers are somewhere to the tune of about 50,000 that are in holding facilities and maybe 30,000 that are on range. And so our thought was we're going to adopt one. This is five years ago. So we said there's now 49,999 left in holding facilities. And then we went and got a second one that we actually got for our daughter. And so now there's 49,998. So we're just doing a countdown. We got a ways to go. save them. These are the last living legends and legacy of America's past. We cannot let that pass away. We need to help these horses. And we're trying to put together sponsors as well as rescues and sanctuaries that will take the horses. So it's a kind of a full-time job, but <laughs> we're trying, we're trying. Instead of buying a horse, we wanted to give horses a home that are overpopulated in a certain area like the Devil's Garden. Well, I'm here to give a couple of horses a home, give them a chance. It looks like he's had a little rough patch with his, his face and some, his hair hangs down in dreads in his face. So he just kind of looked kind of like he needed a friend and so he and I've become buddies. I think this guy would be a great horse. He's number 439, he's right there in the middle. Oh, yeah. No, and behind this bay. <laughs> He's got scars on his face. But it has been healing in the past four weeks that he has been in here. He just has such a great disposition. He'll come to me when I call him. Hey, Bob. Come on. Come here, Bob. Come here. I got food for you. Come here. No? Okay. But he's super healthy and uh, very well built. And He'd be good for somebody to take home. I'm selling 439. He's a sweetheart. I think they all deserve a good home. 
Finally this week from our friends at Texas Farm Bureau comes the controversy of eminent domain and one couple's fight against a major energy corporation. Lynn and Bill Key say they were victims of lowball offers, lack of transparency, even disrespect. They're telling their story and sharing their incredible images of four pipelines running through their farm that's been in their family for 95 years. You know, we're just a postage stamp on the big Texas map, but it's our postage stamp. They do have the right to take you in, but they don't have the right to take advantage of you. We were never given a contract. The landman told us he didn't do contracts. What we were told was one thing and what actually happened was another thing. We were told that this was going to keep our pasture pristine. Over the months that they were here with the trucks that ran up and down our pasture, it was decimated. The initial offers were terribly low. The more we have studied this, we find out that's what happens everywhere. And the thing is, some people go for that. And that's a shame because they're taking advantage of people that don't know what their rights are. Obviously, they're not going to come up to what's really reasonable. Uh, so they come back with a, what they call a final offer. It makes it look like they're suing you for $100,000. That's not the case, but that's the way the verbiage looks. So it scares you. I'll never understand why they can come and do this destruction on your property without even an easement and no compensation and no understanding that you'll get any of that. The, the way it's set up, it is not fair to the landowner. The landowner doesn't have an equal shot or a chance to stand up and say, no, that's not fair, and to negotiate something that is fair. For me, it's lack of communication. And disrespect, lack of telling the truth. Being uh, misled, misrepresented, with no moral compass. We don't want to be victims. We want to be partners right. because we are for uh, Texas energy. Yes. And uh, we we're Texas West Texans. Texans, we understand that. But this is beyond uh, comprehension that they would allow these things to happen to the landowners. So. That's what's hard. I know Texas is better than that because it's been in our family 95 years and I'm trying to be a good steward and I feel like I've failed. Very powerful story. Now, in response to the ongoing battle over eminent domain, Turi Cannon, president of the Texas Pipeline Association, had this to say about it, quote, eminent domain is a seldom used last resort for infrastructure projects. Most disputes with landowners are eventually settled privately. He added, while we are not opposed to addressing changes that might improve the process for landowners, we feel that proposed changes should result in sound policy and not increased litigation, adding delays to the process and making only the lawyers wealthy. And the fight continues. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.